welcome everybody to the second session on toxicology here at the um, pesticide conference. Welcome to everybody, welcome to the speakers. Uh, so I would like to ask the first speaker to uh, come here. Sofia Marcel, she's working at SEO here in Spain, and she's going to tell us about yeah, how to work with farmers um, to protect bird life. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the organization for this forum as well. Um, as Daniela said, I'm Sofia Morsell. I work for SEO Bird Life. Um, it's an NGO that works with nature conservation in, in Spain. Um, on this session, I want to uh, talk about pesticides and wildlife friendly farming. Um, as we all know, pesticides agrochemicals used to protect humans from various diseases and are also known by their ability to cause a large number of negative health and environmental effects. We know that some pesticides disrupt food webs, killing plants and insects, and removing weed seeds from the environment, which may be essential food uh, or habitats for some bird species, and so represents a high risk for their conservation. Uh, on SEO bird life, is very, we are very concerned by the environmental impacts of the widespread uh, use of pesticides, and we believe that if they must be used, it should be done uh, subjected to appropriate scrutiny in a target way and with respect to the environment. Um, on the other hand, we are living in a biodiversity crisis and there are multiple threats facing our, uh, our wildlife, including habitat loss, pollution, and climate change. We are um, with around 1 million, 1 million species facing extinction uh, worldwide. Population of European farm members have been declined by 4% since the 90s, and dramatic insect the lightness right across the globe. So we think that governments need to step up their support for farmers to facilitate this as a larger scale and protect people and nature. But how much pesticide is used in Spain in agriculture? The vast majority of pesticide in Spain is used in agriculture. Uh, this, um, this table, uh, sorry, uh, it's, not, it's not working, uh, indicates the available data for overall treated area of arable crops in Spain uh, per type. The table shows that uh, the number of hectares treated with pesticides have increased by 4% in the last eight years. That's not a lot, but if we go to this other table, um, so is the overall amount of pesticides per hectare using arable crops at the national level between uh, 2011 sorry, and 2019. This data shows how pesticides uh, per hectare in Spain increased by 57%. Uh, percent in the last eight years, which is quite a lot. And um, also, if you check um, the green veg vegetables, um, it has uh, increased, you, you see there that it has increased a lot uh, in the last eight years. So um, one of the case study that we want to talk here is um, about two different bird species, red ledge partridge and gray partridge. Um, on the first experiment on red ledge partridge, previous studies um, have shown that uh, chick mortality was a key factor and that this was related to the quantity of insects they have available to it. The number of chicks in each uh, brood half when the field were sprayed conventionally, 
conventionally with a um, uh, pesticide compared to the fields where a six meter strip around the edge of the field was left unsprayed. On another study, another experiment uh, with gray partridge, um, the test uh, done with um, uh, some scientific scientists wanted to, to know whether the herbicides and fungicides used on cereal fields reduce their survival of gray partridge chicks. Uh, they, they saw that the elimination of pesticides requires activations of various detoxification systems in an organism and that energy and resources allocated to biodegradation of pesticides cannot be allocated to other functions as, such as growth. Um, compared to, so the, they, they use two different groups of, uh, of chicks. They use one group of chicks uh, fed with organic grains and another one fed with conventional grains where uh, they were treated with pesticides. On the one that um, they, they, they fed with convention, conventional grains, they saw that compared with organic pears, conventional pears yield smaller chicks at hatching that had a, a, low, a lower body mass index at 24 the, days old. But additionally, these chicks also displayed lower hematocrit. So, um, on conclusion, they saw, the, the scientific saw, that the chicks that were fed with conventional grains where pesticides had been used, um, their body mass was, were lower, their shape uh, and their health was also lower than the ones that were fed with organic grains. On this other um, case study, um, I'm sorry because the, I don't know why, but um, the, the letters are not very well shown here. It must be about the, the type of um, letters that I'm using. Um, on this European project we are currently working on, uh, that is uh, known as Olivares Vivos, is a life project. Um, we are working with farmers using um, environmental friendly uh, systems. Um, we've seen uh, after five years of projects uh, that farmers were, some, were uh, they had some anxious moments when they first started because they didn't know very well how the project will help them to um, to, to have um, better crops um, and, and also a good product in the end. But um, they saw that uh, the crop yields are a little lower now, but the yield losses are more than made up for by the reduction in how much they spend to, to produce the, the food. And what is more important is that um, their farm now is more resilient to weather and also to market fluctuations. And also, um, also one of the important um, factors that we've seen after this project known as Olivares Vivos is that we have more pollinator species, um, we have a better pest control of the crops, also, uh, the farmer have to invest less on, on pesticides. And also, um, one of the farmers that we are working on, um, they, won, they recently won um, an award, an international award for olive oil. Um, so the company increased its um, international prestige as well. So we have different conclusions here. The first of it is that sober life is very concerned about the environmental impacts in the widespread of pesticides. We believe that if they must be used, it should be with care, with a target way and with respect to the environment. 
Um, we are calling for a national pesticide reduction target to be implemented in Spain. This should include the creation of an independent organization that encourage farmers improving the natural health of our countryside. And this organization should be implemented with the help of environmental NGOs, such as Sober Life, and should promote initiatives such as free training systems and gathering events. We need also a better support for an integrated pest management approach, uh, where pesticides are used only as a last resource. And in this regard, pesticide registration is an important step in the management of pesticides. Um, we have seen in Spain that some of the pesticides that uh, uh, have uh, been sold are not yet re registered. Um, and this, um, if they are registered, uh, enables author authorities, sorry, primarily to determine which products are permitted to be used and for what purpose. And it also makes possible the control over quality. Also, we must recognize the important role that the healthy thriving ecosystem can play in supporting sustainable farming. And pest predators, pollinators, wildlife in the soil can all help to grow food and sustain long-term yields, while continued reliance on pesticides threaten long-term sustainable food production and a healthy environment. And finally, we encourage environmental stewardship agreements, not only in Spain, but in the whole Europe, with the main aim of reducing the risk and the use of pesticides on the environment. This could be an effective way to support, in, um, to support uh, sustainable farming. Thank you very much. And also, if you have any um, uh, questions, you can ask me now, or either you can email me on, on that email that I'm showing you on the, on the screen. Thank you. You said it would be important to promote IPM. Now, there's always two ways how something can move. You either push it or you pull it. In Switzerland, we have a lot of success with uh, organic and also IPM. But the, the, the big reason is in my country, we have two uh, very big food companies, food retailers, Migros and Coop. And Coop 30 years ago made it a strategic decision that they want to promote organic production. and. They have about 40% of the market share, so that was an important decision. And Migros was then forced, late, 10 years later on, forced to take a similar decision, saying that we will not go organic, but we will go IPM. So I don't know whether in Spain you have similar retailing giants, but maybe having them into the boat and saying we give to farmers a better price, we support them in transferring to organic production, you would have an important ally who could help you promoting what you try to do. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have big retailers um, here in Spain, but I think, um, I don't think, as, as far as I know, I don't think they, they have implemented those changes. And maybe my organization needs to work uh, together with those retailers to, to make those changes in the future. Just do it. Maybe it doesn't work first time, but fifth time it will work. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm impressed by the presentation. Uh, you are very rational and very correct in your analysis. Um, my question is, in Spain, what this all makes sense, but what are the barriers that are preventing its dissemination and uptake by farmers? What do you think are the biggest barriers to that? I think one of the most important barriers that they have is that they don't have the information available. So that's why we are um, we want to um, open um, farmers to a kind of new NGO or 
um, I don't know if the, the correct um, um, possibility will be a, could be a new NGO organization, but something where they can all be connected, they can uh, get information um, and they can um, change to um, uh, use less pesticides in the future. Um, also, I think that some of the farmers right now are also afraid of taking that change in the future. But I think also one more time is because they don't have enough information to take that, that step forward. Uh, now I would like to introduce our second speakers, uh, speaker, Anna Maria Ianetta from uh, University of Teramo in Italy. Good morning. Uh, the study that I present today concerning the toxicological evaluation of uh, glyphosate in zebrafish early life stage. And uh, glyphosate is a systemic and non-selective post-emergency foliar herbicide and uh, is today known as the most uh, widely used herbicide worldwide. This herbicide uh, operates uh, at the level of uh, APSPS enzyme uh, inhibiting him. And uh, the inhibition of this enzyme determined the uh, phytotoxicity of the compound and uh, destroyed the plant uh, by three ways. The first way is the loss of essential amino acid. The second way is the alteration of uh, chlorophyll photosynthesis. And the third way is the accumulation of uh, toxic uh, products. The um, aim of this study is to investigate uh, the um, potential effect of uh, the development of uh, zebra fishery life stage. And uh, we use this uh, in vivo model because uh, this is an excellent tool for experimental studies um, that concerning the um, uh, toxicity of uh, environmental contaminants. Uh, zebra fish early life stage used uh, in the experiment were obtained from the University of Teramo facility and uh, adult wild type AB strain zebra fish were bred in a recirculating water system with uh, a like dark cycle. The day after the, um, the afternoon before the spawning, the groups of male and male were placed in a breeding tanks and uh, the eggs were collected the um, following morning. The fish embryo acute toxicity tests were performed in according to OECD uh, guidelines and the aim of this test is to evaluate the acute toxicity of glyphosate in zebra fish early life stage. The tested concentration were 25, 50, 100, 110, 125 milligram per liter. And uh, negative control and positive control were also tested. Three replicates uh, were performed and uh, um, the selecting embryos were placed individually in two ml of test solution in each, um, in each well and uh, 20 embryos were, um, were tested for each treatment. Zebra fish early life stage were daily observed up to 96 hour post fertilization with the inverted optical microscope, considering for lethal alteration. The coagulation of embryo, the lack of detachment of the tail from the old sac, lack of the summit formation, absence of heartbeat. And uh, at the end of the exposure period, uh, were calculated the um, lethal dose 10, lethal dose 20, and lethal dose 50. The sublethal effect uh, and the histological analysis was performed. 
for uh, the histological analysis, uh, survived larvae at 96 hour post fertilization, treated with all concentration, were fixed in 10% neutral buffered formalin for two hours. And after the thickness section were stained with uh, hematoxylin and uh, eosin, and then visualized by light microscope. Uh, the results of uh, fish embryo acute toxicity test were obtained by uh, Toxrat software and uh, at the 1960 hour for, for our post fertilization, the LD10 was uh, 85, the LD20 was 96, and the LD50 was 122. And uh, regarding the toxicological endpoints, uh, uh, there are different studies uh, in agreement or not uh, with uh, our results. In fact, uh, in this uh, first study, the um, lethal dose 50 is uh, lower than uh, our results. Uh, this because in this study, um, they use uh, different chemicals. But uh, in the second study, at the uh, at uh, 19 hour 96 hour post fertilization at 50 mg per liter the ld50 um, is about uh, 20% in according with our results in addition to toxicological um, endpoint, we, are, we um, evaluated also the sublethal alteration. And in fact, uh, um, but uh, uh, only for cert certain concentration. And in fact, from the concentration of 100 to 110 milligram per liter, the larvae showed a pericardial edema and uh, impaired blood flow and blostasis. In addition, a great number of uh, zebrafish larvae showed a smaller head than the negative control. It's possible to observe in the figure C the normal size of the head and the pericardial region, and in the figure A and B the small head and the increase of the pericardial region in larvae that was treated with the glyphosate. Uh, regarding the cardiotoxicity, um, in according with uh, several authors, uh, this alteration can be related to the dysregulation of myocyte enhancer factor 2 that uh, is involved in the development of uh, heart muscle. And uh, um, regarding the smaller head that uh, showed the larvae exposed of uh, glyphosate, uh, this alteration suggesting a neurological involvement. In fact, uh, in, uh, according to um, several studies, this alteration can be related uh, to reduction of essential genes for the normal development of the central nervous system, such as PAX2, PAX6, OITX2, EPHA4. In fact, the aim of the, the future will be to evaluate the alteration of the regulation of these genes. For uh, the um, results of histological analysis, uh, this confirmed the, the results of fit test. In fact, 18% of embryo treated with glyphosate at uh, 20, uh, 100 to 110 milligram per liter showed the high pericardial edema and diffuse hepat hepatic microvaculus that uh, is possible to observe in these two sections. In conclusion, in this study, uh, we confirmed the, the toxicity of um, glyphosate in zebrafish early life stage at the tested concentration. And uh, glyphosate uh, has been proclaimed safe for the um, human and for animals because they don't have the target APSPS enzyme. But uh, several studies demonstrate the, the, um, that uh, many microbes uh, have the shikimate pathway, and uh, this aspect uh, can be represent a risk for uh, human microbiota. 
finally, uh, the aim of future, future study uh, will be to evaluate the long-term effect of uh, glyphosate. Thank you for your attention. First of all, congratulations for your work. We have one doubt. How did you introduce to the fish this glyphosate toxicity? How do you conduct this first test to include and to introduce the glyphosate in the fish? Okay, so first of all, what you can do is to introduce it in the egg to find other studies. In, in the first, uh, uh, we uh, search uh, in the literature uh, other study uh, when um, uh, evaluated the acute toxicity in zebrafish. That uh, is not at present. Uh, you, um, you do a um, ranging test when the, you taste a different concentration and after uh, um, you, uh, you do the, the fit test. It's, uh, uh, the method is this. Um, Professor Emeritus Ahmad Madavi, he's going to talk to us about highly hazardous pesticide use in Iran compared to the EU. Uh, after many years of work on pesticides, uh, in recent years, uh, there are lots of discussion about the new or a particular group of compounds called are highly hazardous pesticides, that they, are, they have uh, big and both acute and also chronic effects on uh, uh, different life system. And so we started a wide work since some years ago to uh, manage to maybe eradicate, or not eradication is very difficult, uh, it, I think this one, okay, let go. This is uh, the topics that I'm going to cover in this short time now. Uh, there are, you know, many problems with pesticides that, uh, especially with hazardous pesticides, and we were discussing about these compounds under the SICAM discussion since uh, we were in Cambridge in 2019, before Corona. Then later we had to sit by the computer and go and go every day uh, to talk about these compounds and how to manage them really. It was a difficult form. Uh, <clears throat> there are many problems as you see. We dealt as, because I am a basic insect toxicologist, we went through the uh, life of insects in Guelph, Canada, and uh, other places during my PhD, even to the depth of the Darwin, and to see really uh, what are these creatures since Precambrian era, about 200, 300 million years ago, and their relations with plants. They are not going. They are, we have less and less population of insects that is supposed to be five times of human mass population on the Earth. But there are many, many families are all dis disappearing from the uh, planet. And that's a big, you know, alert and danger that we have to consider it. There are, you know, honeybees that is, is been discussing a long time about it, and uh, pollinators. Uh, <clears throat> the bad problem is that with Pesticide, dangerous compound loss like pesticide. In developing countries, the management is different. In developed world, you know, they are using lots of pesticide. The management is good, but we have so many people get killed because um, of bad infrastructure. We call it bad infrastructure. And so it's uh, uh, causing lots of damage to people, environment, and wildlife. That's uh, something that we have been so going to many conferences and discussing about this since about 20 years ago. And uh, 
there are big disasters, you know, in Bhopal. Also, we had disasters in Iran. It happened in Peru, it happened again in Bihar, India. Children killed uh, by this uh, very dangerous compound, highly hazardous pesticide. And there are uh, global agencies, FAO and WHO, they are trying to manage, but they, they really have to consider, many times I mentioned myself in our discussions, they have to consider the uh, problems of these compounded developing countries separately. Separate even regulation and management, because it's different. So because of it, it didn't work. And every day, as I mentioned yesterday, there in another session, they are increasing and increasing these compounds uh, every year, more and more use. Now, there are lots of discussion about highly hazardous pesticide now because they are uh, known uh, dangerous materials uh, in five groups. And this is where we discuss in SICAM, under this SICAM. For me, it's a long time, really, about 50 years, 50 years work on pesticides, since 1972 that I'm working. Now, see, all are working, and we are aware about all these works, about the pesticide and gender issues, ladies, women. Even though they say that in men, a sperm count is getting low, but really the danger for pregnant women. We had a different dis discussions, the ladies group, that uh, one good one in Germany, uh, Dr. Hemati and others, there are no very uh, good discussion that I was also part of that and we were following that. I did also ex high exposure to these compounds myself. I got two, three, four times getting really to die. Uh, when I was starting to use and work for my research, it was about, as I said, 50 years ago. That was 50 years ago, 10 years after the Russell Carson, you know, gave alert to the world about these compounds. But still, because I was in Iran, in many developing, there was nothing about the environment that time. Nothing. And we were exposed because I was doing lots of experiments in garden and crops and working for uh, professors that had relation with companies. Not now. Companies had a very, very good uh, activities in Iran. Good, it means wide but with dangerous material. Uh, so there was, a, uh, in Iran, we also here in cotton fields, that I was there. Big, big planes, hundreds. They were Bulgarian, they call it. The, really, this side, Envergur of the wing, and hundreds of them every day in the northern Iran by the Caspian. They were polluting the whole thing. All types of, all types of pops. Aldrin, Dirdrin, that we called it hush e o the, it, a compound turbidon. It was, it was a mixture of the DDT, parathion and DDT, uh, excuse me, parathion, DDT, and toxophen, <laughs> toxophen. All type, and now the soil is there polluted, very polluted. That's what really I wanted to tell these companies maybe to have a work. It's the northeast of Iran near Turkmenistan. I was there that time. I'm talking about maybe and later of that, maybe 45 to 50 years ago. There are lots of pollution. I had some talks in recent years in China and other places about wetlands. I am a wetland person also with drums are. Because I lived and worked about 20 years in Mazandaran by the Caspian. Mazandaran is the place of Ramsar. You know, the wetland is under the name of Ramsar. The very beautiful city that Ramsar Convention started about 70, 1972, more than 50 years ago. So we were uh, just working and trying to see how much damage from the agricultural rice paddies come to the wetlands, a lot. 
a lot. And birds, uh, I, we were related to the migratory birds also in convention of CMS that I talked for it in uh, Toledo here, very other beautiful city about the, the, uh, the lady talked about the uh, you know, wildlife exposure. I talked about it, that how much pesticides really we showed them are dangerous for uh, birds. We have a city in the Mazandaran, um, it's called Feridun Kalar. It's called ho ho all over the world as the slaughterhouse of migratory birds. Because migratory birds come in the winter and they all get exposed and killed. 10 million comes to Iran and <laughs> Five million goes back. And it's 10 years, 20 years that we are giving to the environment. But no, you know, in Iran, what's happening? I'm not scared to say that, you know. They release everything, doing nothing, just religious thing and everything. So, no, <laughs> really in a bad situation. These are, I had many, many, you know, conferences. It are just few of them that we thought, and this is also a uh, Toledo uh, talk that we did there about the exposure of uh, this. Uh, the insects <clears throat> are going. Insects themselves as the, for example, food of the birds. And even that one is affecting on the population of birds. Many of these pesticides, I work with them during this 50 work, different work, lab work in the analysis. I stood 10 years by GC analysis, different this is I worked with, we did uh, different uh, works on the experimental work in the field. But these are all, this diazinon is supposed to go, but it still come back. You can find it always in the field. And very, very dangerous material, you know, all the car, it's chemic, two milligram per kilogram. We worked uh, very good in Guelph that I did PhD and uh, later other places about the real the good that I asked the lady about acute toxicity testing, how to analyze it. We wrote a program that later they used it in US even. So insects themselves are going and there's a big discussion about it <clears throat> that uh, I'm following that. Pollinators are going. If preventing poisoning, it, it came back, I think this. See, this is what I uh, asked today, actual thickness, that uh, it is my Facebook, just is a picture of my Facebook, that is all about this, my Facebook, since many years ago. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, these are going and coming back in Iranian market, as well as in the whole MENA. We try to concentrate on the Middle East and North, North African countries. That you know, it is the, now the place of those dust hole. Go to the Google and you see the color is different. We have all dust cover and many people believe that it's going by 30 years. There will be nothing. No Saudi Arabia, no Iran, nothing because of the desert certification that now is going very bad and nobody in other countries or there are, are Saudi Arabia is doing very good now they're doing good plan to just greenery there but but nothing in Iran unfortunately I introduced the neem tree this is Persian lost father but this is neem that I introduced it from the Persian Gulf I didn't discover it it was there somebody 200 years ago brought it uh, is to Iran Persian Gulf islands and I cult cultivated, I planted thousands of neem tree. That is a very good source of uh, natural pesticide. Uh, this is Persian lost powder that it was the first pesticide on the planet 2000 years ago. Go to the internet, please, you can find it. Persian lost powder. Iranians were exporting laos and kutis, and you know the problem today again. It is coming back. The, um, anyway, we found that regulation stops at the border and really good regulations that exist in Europe and North America. Could you think about the time? How much? Can you come to an end? Sorry? It's closing. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's not coming to developing countries and we have bad situations really. Because I'm 
what I recommended always is certification and licensing. The best recommendation that it, in our discussion that I mentioned with the South Africa, Cape Town University is going every week. I always recommend we need certification and licensing uh, safe system in developing countries. We discussed a lot with FAO about these things, but uh, hopefully that these things happen soon. Uh, yeah, in the Toledo, we discussed about the uh, second generation anticoagulant rodenticide that doing a lot of harm to, you know, other uh, rodents and other, other bears also. That's a dangerous situation. Um, this is a long work for me, and these are some of the recommendations that I made, and you can find it even online if you go searching my name or other things on, the, on Google. Some of these the recommendations in, uh, from our discussion site and discussion are there about highly hazardous pesticides in the pesticide forum. Also, all, also chemicals in product as well as lead poisoning is more about lead paint but also lead poisoning, you know, we found that in our uh, wetlands, lead are doing a lot poisoning to birds because of bullets, because of bullets, you know, they hunt and that things. Uh, I'm sorry that the time, this kind of discussion need uh, more time really, but uh, uh, these are something that uh, my question to the SICAM discussion that what we need in developing countries really to make the situation a little better. Mr. John Vigian is a great man. One problem is, is that FAO, WHO, they are not giving us opportunity. We are now, we know the problem in developing countries, but they are not giving us. Right now, tomorrow I was supposed to go to Nairobi, you know, in the, the science policy. But they always go to the government people, those ones in Iran that praise only, or other places in Middle East, or other places. They have to give opportunity to the people that are involved with this science. Anyway, this is uh, John helped me, a great man. We were communicating since 20 years ago, and eight years ago, I couldn't come to this city that I found later why this city is a beautiful place because I'm a kind of photographer also. And thank you that he made it possible for me. There are lots of other things that here, at least a, at least a picture maybe from Iran. No, that's, uh, uh, this is my civil society and this is where I did retire myself 20 years ago because I was not able to do both religion and science. 20 years ago I did retire myself from here and I'm doing just global things now. But thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. From Italy, Marco Minacori from uh, University Sapienza in uh, Rome. Good morning to everyone. I'm Marco. And um, this morning I would share with you uh, some cellular results uh, that can, uh, I hope, that can provide um, the molecular basis to hypothesize. Um, a human body remediation for uh, exposed population to pollutants and especially exposed to beta HCH. Okay, in Italy we have uh, 42 contaminated areas uh, called contaminated areas of national interest and uh, one of these is the Sacco Valley on the south of Rome and um, yeah, the, merge, the environmental problem of uh, this valley emerged in 2005 when, when 25 cows died after drinking water from um, the Sacco River. 
And uh, after the veterinary investigation, the monitoring system, uh, national monitoring system on um, uh, chemical residuals in food uh, found a lot of pesticide, both in the blood and in the milk of cows grazing in the Sacco Valley. Among all these pesticide, there was the beta HCH. Probably a lot of you know about beta HCH, but shortly, beta HCH with the alpha isomer, epsilon, and delta isomers is a byproduct of the synthesis of gamma isomer, better known as lindane. Um, all, uh, all alpha, beta, epsilon, and delta are waste. And uh, in Italy, uh, we stopped uh, to product um, in the Sacco Valley, we stopped to product uh, lindane in uh, uh, 60s, but uh, its legacy is today present with uh, both in the soil and uh, in the populations with the fossil isomer, the beta-HCH. Okay, this is another picture of a uh, Sacco River that uh, um, can uh, better, uh, that can uh, um, help you to better understand the real condition of uh, um, this river. This picture was taken in 2018. In, uh, in the same year, my research group published the first paper in which SAT3 protein, an oncogenic protein, was individuated um, as, the, um, as an other protein of a signaling pathway triggered by beta hexachlorocyclohexane. In 2020, another paper from my research group in which were individuated a number of beta hexachlorocyclohexane cellular targets. And in 2021, we um, demonstrated that beta hexachlorocyclohexane can drive all three stages of carcinogenesis, initiation, promotion, and progression. Yeah, from literature, we understand that um, the scientific world interest is focused especially on the environmental remediation from beta HCH. But what to do with contaminated people, contaminated population who lives in uh, uh, contaminated areas by beta chlorocyclohexane and that have beta HCH in their organism? Well, um, we think that uh, to manage this level, uh, we need of something that can modulate the beta HCH activities, cellular biological activities, something of affordable, quickly available for all, and with a low impact on the environment. For this reason, of course, the answer to all these characteristics, uh, we found the answer of this, uh, to all these characteristics in natural compound and especially natural compound present in the in diet. Okay, so according to our data, our previous data, we know that beta HCH exerts a lot of uh, cellular activity. We know that it has an impact on cell cycle and apoptosis. It induces the DNA damage. It induces the oxidative stress with the switch of the energy metabolism. We know that it is an endocrine disruptor. We observed the activation of androgenic receptor and it is um, an activator of uh, oncogenic pathways. For example, the activation of the oncogenic protein STAT3. So we searched in literature 
natural bioactive compound able to modulate all these characteristics, all these cellular activity. And we found a lot of natural compound, for example, like pentocopherol, tyrosol, hydroxytyrosol, all these compound and others. All these compound are present in two important element of the Mediterranean diet and in two and also common worldwide, the char, tomato and uh, olive. So for our, for our experiment, we decide to use, to treat cells with a supplementary food, a patented supplementary food, composed by the 98% of wall atomized tomato and the 2% of olive meal waste water. water. And, um, well, uh, we prepare a solution uh, from this patented supplementary food uh, that in our experiment we called TOBC solution, tomato and olive bioactive compound. Uh, this solution is enriched of all these compound from tomato and, uh, and olive. The experimental concentration in our experiment, the experimental concentration of, of beta-HCH was extrapolated from an, um, uh, an epidemiological study on uh, Sacco Valley, on people who live in Sacco Valley. This is the experimental concentration of a TOBC solution and the cell line that we used in our experiment is uh, um, LNCAP, that is a prostate carcinoma. Okay, this is the first result, and it is an MTT assay. Uh, is an assay to evaluate the cellular proliferation. Control is represented by untreated cells, and uh, if we treat for 48 hour cells with beta-HCH, we can observe an increase of the cellular proliferation. But uh, if we pre-treat for three hours, cells with the TOBC and then for 48 hours with TOBC and then beta HCH, there is a drastically reduction of cellular proliferation. Then we observed the activation of oncogenic pathways. STAT3 protein is an oncogenic protein, cytosolic oncogenic protein. After the activation, with the phosphorylation on tyrosine 705, there is a nuclear translocation of this protein, and in the nucleus, it uh, is a um, transcription factor, uh, a transcription factor for a lot of genes inv um, involved in the cellular proliferation, migration, invasion, and um, this is a Western blot. Uh, with a relative densitometry, and uh, on uh, the first line there is the activated STAT3. In the control there isn't the activation of this protein. With the treatment of beta-HCH there is a STAT3 activation, and uh, if we pretreat cells with the TOBC there is a drastically reduction of this protein, of the activation of this protein. With this immunofluorescence, we observed the same thing, but uh, we observed the nuclear translocation of this protein, because in the first column, there is uh, the fluorescence of the nucleus. In the second, the fluorescence of the protein. And in the third, the merge of the two uh, column. In the control, there isn't nuclear translocation. STAT3 is uh, around the nucleus. With beta-HCH, there is a nu the nuclear translocation, and uh, this nuclear translocation is reduced with the TOBC. Here, observe the other two receptor, androgen receptor and the arylic hydrocarbon receptor. Also in this case, the activation uh, of this receptor induces the nuclear translocation. And uh, with beta-HCH, there, uh, there is a nuclear translocation of both receptors respect to control that are untreated cells. And uh, in the co-treatment, 
this nuclear translocation is reduced. Then we observed the, the um, reactive oxygen species induced by beta HCH, and with TOBC, there is a reduction of uh, these uh, uh, ROS species. Then we did another essay that is uh, a comet essay to evaluate the DNA damage. After the um, DNA damage, there is a fragmentation of DNA. And with this essay, that is uh, an, ele uh, an electrophoresis to DNA, if there is a DNA fragmentation, we can observe a tail. If there isn't DNA damage, we also observe only the, the head of the comet. In fact, in the control, in, uh, in the control there is only the, the head of, uh, of um, only the head, the head of this uh, um, comet. In beta HCH, we can observe the tail. It means that there is a DNA uh, damage. In the co-treatment with TOBC and beta HCH, there is a reduction of this tail. Then we observed the cellular, apop the cellular apoptosis and beta HCH uh, doesn't induce apoptosis in cells, but in the co with, with the co-treatment with the TOBC, we have a apoptosis, a cellular apoptosis of these cancer cells. The last experiment is a, colo a colony formation assay, and uh, in, this, uh, in this experiment, um, we observe the uh, clonogenic activity of cells, and uh, the more is the number of colony is the number of colonies, more is aggressive the phenotypes. And in fact, if we treat beta, we treat cells with beta HCH, there is an increase of colony number. This number of colony is reduced by the pretreatment with the TOBC. To conclude, the, uh, in our opinion, the environmental remediation concomitant with a continuous health surveillance can be enforced by population remediation strategies. In this context, proper use of standardized and improved fu functional food may be an attractive strategy to implement the protection of exposed population. From our data, TOBC complex of micronutrient, micronutrient can redu reduce the genotoxic and carcinogenetic activity of beta-HCH. This in vitro study provide, we hope, the basis for exploring new strategy for the protection of exposed population. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, my question is, have you got evidence of elevated levels of cancer or DNA damage amongst the population that is exposed to the beta-HCH? And the second part of the question is, in Italy they eat a lot of olive oil and tomatoes, so maybe they're already protected. Um, we haven't uh, evidence in population, unfortunately, but um, um, the, the Italy situation is just a little bit strange. There is a good management of uh, this, uh, this situation, unfortunately. And so we haven't uh, a lot of data that is on, uh, on populations. Uh, yeah, we think that tomato and olive can be a good uh, solution, but are also common, especially tomato is uh, very common all, all, world, all world the world, so I think that um, could be um, a, a different uh, way to um, observe the remediation. I don't know, because um, it's, it's really important the remediation of the population, the, the, uh, the populations, because uh, compound like this uh, has a long half-life in body. Uh, so what should, okay, remediation is, environmental remediation is uh, important, is uh, very, very important. But uh, what to do with people who already have and uh, have to stay with uh, these friends for a lot of uh, years. So am I audible? Hi everyone, we are from Osh Kyrgyzstan and our 
First presentation is about the use of therapeutic agents derived from the plants and fruits growing in Kyrgyzstan for the elimination of OCPs from uh, GIT tract of nursing women. POPs, including the most common and dangerous OCPs, so is a problem that remains pressing in the rural areas. And OCP exposure is linked to higher rates of various pathologies of pregnant women, fetuses, newborns, and infants. So in southern Kyrgyzstan, OCPs are the major cause of a number of pathologies, which are including as cancers, hepatitis, infant encephalopathies, dysbacteriosis, immunodeficiency, and so on. Uh, it's well known that the pectin substances are used uh, to remove the ecotoxicants. So for the prevention of the above pathologies, taking into account uh, that like most of the OCPs, like probably 100 persons are taken to the body through the GAT. So there is only one way to eliminate OCPs from the GAT and this is a search of therapeutic agents for their elimination from the body. Because as you know, the these sites are used to be accumulated in the body and they cannot be removed by the like, natural way. So uh, the breast milk samples were collected from the woman who contacted us about the illness of their children, like from the maternity hospital and the woman themselves. So all samples were collected with the written consent of participants according to all ethical standards. Uh, special attention was given to the cases, uh, and there were most of them when the examinations were carried out at the request for the examined woman. Like since we covered all of the, the expenses for the examination, further conducting treatment, aimed uh, at uh, removing of OCPs from the body of nursing woman mothers uh, with the use of therapeutic agents. So we obtain it from local endemic plants and their fruits, which possess sorbent and detoxic properties. So, um, so therefore, selected the woman who came to us on 28th, third day after the childbirth, through the labor. So uh, the concentrate was used in the form of tea uh, daily, like two teaspoons, which means 15 grams per 300 milliliters of boiled water, brewed in the thermos and administrated during a day. So a golden root tincture, uh, analogous to ginseng, produced by the Institute of Medical Problems, uh, derived from radiola rosea, like the proportion is one to 10 in a 30% of alcohol solution, uh, which grows in a high mountains region like the um, altitude is about from 2,500 up to 3,500 meters above the sea level. In Chongalai district, this is the uh, district of the Osh region in the Kogus Republic. So the tincture was administrated by 25, 30 drops twice in a day. The course of treatment was from 10 to 12 days. So uh, this is the program which we use for the processing of the information. So uh, in table one, uh, you can see the results of toxicology examination of the breast, uh, breast milk, uh, which were taken morning or anterior and posterior which mean residual portions of breast milk like from in total we have collected from uh, 82 nursing mothers so breast milk samples about 10 milliliters were collected in a sterile disposable tube with means in syringe uh, with a lid and then transferred to the laboratory in the same container so sampling of breast milk blood breast milk blood and urine for OCP was carried out in accordance with the methodological recommendation on the uh, gaze chromatograph, which called Cvet 500M, uh, the it, like certified and manufactured uh, in the Russia. 
Uh, the presence of the following pesticide was determined for the HCH, alpha, beta, gamma, sigma isomers, uh, DDT, DDD, and DDE isomers, like aldrin, d aldrin, and giptachlor. So all women under observation were allocated into the two groups. Uh, first group consisted of 27 nursing women, and group two, which is control uh, group, included 24 women. Women in group two didn't receive any treatment. Uh, in group one, the concentrate derived from medical herbs was used to neutralize and remove the pesticides from GAT, including crushed seeds, which contains unsaturated fatty acids up to the four persons growing in southern region of the Caucasus Republic and mid and high mountain areas. Uh, so they are rich in vitamins, pectins, microelements, and biological active substances. So with slightly bile, uric, and diaphoretic properties. So the following types of OCP were found in the breast milk of the woman under the observation. So in the first group, uh, the number of samples was 27 and HCH was found in 15 of them. So the percentage is about 55 percent. DDE was found in 24 samples of the breast milk. So here you may see the concentration level of the HPC site. And here you may see the results after the treatment. And here you may see the uh, results of the second control group, which didn't get any treatment. So in the second table, you may see the level of the OCPs in the blood sample. Here is the same structure. So first group, treatment, second group without treatment. So uh, in the blood, the, of the blood samples of the first group, nurse and women, was found at like in nine cases and DDE in 15. In the control group, 16 and 12. So after the treatment, uh, the number of detected in the blood samples was six and DDE was 15. Concentration. So HCH in the blood samples were detected in nine cases, which is about 33 persons. And uh, after the treatment, the HCH was found in six cases, like about 22 persons. So DDE detection rate uh, remained at the same level, about amounting to 55, but concentration level decreased. So uh, detection rate of HCH in blood in control group remained unchanged, amounting to 66.7, but concentration level, level decreased by 1.36 times. The rate of DDE detection in blood uh, on the contrary increased from 50 to 66.7 and concentration by 1.15 times. So in the third table, you can see the uh, concentration levels of OCP in urine samples before and after the treatment. Uh, the level of HCH in urine samples increased from 11.1 before the treatment to 22.2 after the course of treatment, but concentration level decreased by 50 eight times. DDE from 33% cases uh, before treatment to 3.7 after the treatment, and only DDE traces were detected. Uh, in control group, the levels of HCH and DDE in breast milk samples and HCH level in blood samples remained at 66.7 and in urine samples remained unchanged. DDE level in breast milk, on the contrary, increased from 50 to 66.7. In urine, the level of HCH remained at 50%, and the D increased from 12.5 12 12 to 16.7. So uh, 
So in group two, no changes were registered in the control group. The detection of rate of HCH and DDE remained unchanged. So despite the results obtained, there are still many questions to be answered. First, a question concerning uh, the therapeutic agents derived. Uh, these agents are multi-component. They contain pectin substance with sorbent properties, contain lipids that can absorb OCPs, antioxidant vitamins, trace elements, and other biological active substances, which can probably form compounds with OCPs, preventing absorption from the GAT and subsequently limit from the body. But this issue requires studies for stool samples for OCP before and after the treatment. On the other hand, we cannot exclude a possible decay or decomposition of OCPs in GAT. So this issue requires more detailed experimental studies. So does the therapeutic agents obtained from medicinal plants, including endemic, endemic plants and fruits, as well as a tincture of the golden root, are effective for the neutralization and elimination of OCPs from GAT? But further targeted experimental studies are needed on a larger number of patients. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. As you say to yourself, the first results look interesting and encouraging, but there's still a lot of studies to do. Uh, do you get funding easily, or that's a major issue to find funding to, to move on with your research? Okay, he's saying that uh, everything is obviously linked to money, but uh, funding for some further studies, uh, they have not been successful so far. Now we're, talk we're going to talk about our experience of applying the results of research and evidence-based medicine for improving the awareness, achieving compliance with safety measures, and implementing recommendation by the population living in the areas polluted by OCPs. So the problem of OCP in the South Kyrgyzstan are caused by two peset burial grounds left since the Soviet era. So they are located in the Suzak district of the Jalalabad region. In total, in Kyrgyzstan, we have seven regions and 45 sites of agricultural aviation with the residues of pesticides stored there is about 183 storehouses where pesticides were previously stored. So some territories uh, the so-called plagio zones, where the OCPs were used to fight against fleas of marmots, carriers of the plague, fields where industrial crops of cotton and tobacco used to be grown, and where the city was used for pest control. So here you may see the map of the Kyrgyzstan and the highlighted area. This is the Jalabat region, and in the southern part, which is colored yellow. Uh, I think I need to light it. So it's about like the southern part of Kyrgyzstan. It's not exact, but it's about like this. So just for you to understand. Uh, so there are about 1 million hectares of croplands in the south of Kyrgyzstan. So 60% of them uh, were used during the Soviet period to sow industrial crops, which are the tobacco and cotton. And for the growth, for the better results, were used very large amounts of pesticides. Uh, where at the moment, because this is the crop plants, <coughs> now at the moment, the population use, is using these areas for the growth of melons, vegetables, fruits, and other species. So here you may see the condition of the storage at the moment. Despite the fact that it was used 35 years ago, OCPs are still found in, in the environments. This is the same condition of the storages. So the problem of preserving the health of the population living near these places comes first. So on the back side, you may see the crop plants that they are used for some kind of vegetables, like corn, for example. There you may see the plants. And uh, one of the reasons for the ingestion of OCPs from the environment is the lack of knowledge and awareness of the population about the places where the 
OCPs are found and their impact on human health. Uh, here you may see that the, uh, here you may see the <clears throat> sorry. This is the pesticides. So as you can understand, they should not be stored like this. So um, this photo is like widely spread in the internet and it was in many in some of the abstracts and you can see that near the pesticide storage the children were playing and like no one controls them because the lack of awareness awareness of the population you may see how the cows is feeding and as the previous uh lecture from Italy were said that they like uh, poisoning of cows which drink the water from the river so here you may see the same like after right after the rain where when the OCPs like are grow uh, moving out on the surface of the ground and after this the like, cows feeding there so uh, in 2020 2010 in 2010 uh, in the midst of that, Trump's, the content of COPs was like about uh, 0 0.013 milligram per kilogram. HCH from 0 0.005 milligram per kilogram. So out of 32 poisoned people who consumed fried liver and meat of the same frame. So the serum of three children showed DDT, DD, and HCD alpha and betas. So in all three did not exceed like less than 0 0.005 milligrams per liter. So as you can see, the local population cultivates cotton, maize, and the other fruits near the storage of pesticides. This is the uh, condition of the air strip. Uh, here in the cans, you may see like it uh, they were like dig it out by some local people. They were dig it out by some local people and they were dig it out from the pesticide storage because they don't know what they. So here we may see that near the airstrip where the plants were taking the pesticides near the airstrip. That is the new buildings and new houses because of lack of information. How much time we have? Shall I speed up? Uh, yes, you have about another uh, seven minutes. Oh, thank you. So um, to raise the awareness and executive discipline of the population living in the environmentally unfavorable places, Institute of Medical Problems, which is the South Branch National Academy of Sciences, the Kyrgyz Republic, formed a group of toxicologists, chemists, microbiologists, radiologists, ecologists, epidemiologists, and other clinical laboratory and diagnostic specialists to develop acceptable, simple, easy, uh, and easy way to implement and scientifically based methods and recommendation uh, with the elements of evidence-based medicine for the local population. So the group studied the effects of OCPs found in the breast meal, blood, urine, feces, semen, hair, nails, tumor, and pathological tissues, organs, and in the environment and their effects in the examined woman and their newborn and children, how like which was mentioned in the previous presentation. So Simultaneous uh, examination were carried out by the obstetrician, gynecologist, neonatologist, neuropathologist, cardiologist, with all of the specialities. So the data obtained were entered in a specially designed research map and Excel sheet. Laboratory specialists, toxicologists, chemists, and so on, uh, collected human and environmental samples for laboratory research. Environmental experts studied the presence of active factors 
epidemiologists the disease incidence of the population depending on pesticide loads and other environmental factors. Clinical specialists carried out preventive examination of the population. Uh, group three includes 17 women living in the Aravan. It's still Osh region, but it's on the uh, southern direction, uh, formerly cotton growing region. So the population grow cotton uh, and are engaged in cultivation of vegetables, melons, legumes, fodder crops because of like better climate. The um, the farmers in this area they may get the uh, fruits and vegetables like, till twice in a year. So group four included 24 women living in the cotton growing zone in the village of Burgandi, Nokian district. All of this, this is the Jalabat region. So uh, in the subgroup A included nine women living in the village of Urujar are located like one, two kilometers from the unpaved agricultural airport, which functioned until 1985. Then it was turned into the, an arable field where cotton was growing until 1994. The pollution switched to cultivation of fruits, vegetables, gourds, for crops, and so on. So in this area, the surface of the earth has the slopes. So the soil and OCPs are washed away by irrigation water and rainfalls. Subgroup B include 24 women uh, living in the village located at a distance like of four to six kilometers above the Agra airport. So in this study, the following types of OCPs were found in the breast milk, HCH, which are like alpha, gamma, beta, DD. So the highest percentage, like 100% of cases and degree of OCP pollution was found in group five. Subgroup A, women living in the village, Sakaldi near the former agricultural airport. Uh, you, it was mentioned in the picture where the local population were having the rest near the cropland. And the smallest percentage was in group one, uh, far from the former plague fossil, like 5.88 of cases. Uh, it was the distance about six to seven kilometers from the former plaque fossil and consumed food grown in their garden and obtained from domestic animals grazing away from the former plague fossil. So it means away from the areas polluted by OCPs. Uh, so therefore the data obtained indirectly indicated that despite the fact that more than, than 30 years have passed, OCPs remained unchanged in the soil. So, when we were conducting the seminars, webinars, meetings, conversation, and preparing the calendars, booklets, handouts, we used the results of scientific research, data on pathologies diagnosed by medical specialists, and laboratory tests. So we also prepared recommendations for the local population. Local authorities, agronomists, environmentalists, medical workers, uh, member of different NGOs, means non-governmental organization and activists. So nevertheless, based on the results of the study, the following recommendations can be made for the population living in the study area. So prohibit farmers from growing fruits, vegetables, legumes, gourds, fodder crops, as well as grazing animals at distance of minimum four to five kilometers from the polluted area. Means agro airports and uh, destroyed pesticide storehouses. To state environmental protection agents and local agronomists like are recommended to carry out soil remediation through winter spring soil leaching, planting trees, which are then used by local residents only as a building materials. For medical workers, the population living in the near place of former of polluted areas to be classified as a risk group. And for women who uh, and for women to conduct like breath milk or breastfeeding examinations for OCP, if they are found, to take appropriative preventive measures. So as regards scientific aspect, it's necessary to study the actions of OCP in the human body that penetrate through the GIT, taking into account the nature of diet and lifestyle of the local populations, means ethnopsychology, what, what kind of fruits and vegetables they used to use for their diet, how they cook their dishes, 
which dishes are taken mostly in a row or already fried or boiled. So all of these things should be take, take, uh, took in attention. So also during the seminars, uh, we cited specific examples. For example, your and your child's illness is due to OCP in your body, which came through cow's milk, meat and dairy vegetables, melons, grains and legumes grown in the polluted areas. So therefore, in order to maintain health, you should follow these recommendations. In these places and fields, you have to plant trees only for building materials and graze animals uh, away from polluted areas. So such meetings and seminars gave good results. The local population began to comply with our recommendations and demand that the authorities solve environmental problems. So here you may see like uh, outreach or the work with population should be started from uh, the discussion and explanation to the most respected members of the society in the Central Asia, it means Aksakals. Uh, it's translated as an older generation. So in the society, they have a big authority. And if they come to the conclusion, the population will listen to them. So meeting of the physicians for the women. Uh, in order to improve, raise the awareness and achieve compliance with safety measures and implementation uh, of recommendations by the population living in the places polluted by OCPs. So it's necessary to conduct a comp comprehensive study to determine the degree of danger for the population health. So for this, it's necessary to use breast milk as a biomarker and carry out a preventive examination of the population. So when carrying out activities, use the data obtained from studies with specific examples. Provide the local population the results of studies and recommendations so that they could demand from the local authorities. So the implementation of measures to eliminate OCP's pollution on the basis of the Stockholm Convention. To increase the effectiveness of ongoing seminars, meetings among the population and to raise the awareness and executive discipline, it's recommended to conduct a comprehensive study of the area. Examining the local population by using our methods with the elements of evidence-based medicine. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Timur. Okay, then let me try to wrap up, I think, a very mixed set of various presentations. I think we heard from the last two speakers, obviously, that uh, we have a legacy, and it's not visible uh, only in landfills, but also in the soil on which we live and in the bodies uh, which uh, carry our life. And, uh, so it is a real issue and we need to find real life situ uh, solutions. So we have heard two presentations. I liked very much your quote saying that we should not only remediate the soil, but also we need to think how to remediate human bodies. So we have uh, heard, I think, a very interesting option both from you, again, supporting the Mediterranean uh, diet that it's uh, very healthy, <laughs> you should try to add the one glass of red wine, <laughs> whether that also helps. <laughs> and also from Rachmanbeck, I thought it was a very interesting to hear what medical plants from Kyrgyzstan could do, and I hope there will be possibilities that this study could uh, be pursued and also obviously also uh, see whether that could be used on a wider scale. Uh, we have also seen a few presentations, obviously looking at the toxicology, but it's also clear that, uh, that a lot of things are still unclear and it's not easy to say. And uh, in my opinion, we should probably also start not to look at the traditional uh, cause impact relation but today we are living in a world where there is not one single chemical impacting you and having one single cause uh, 
uh, but we having obviously a world where we are living in a mix of cocktails outside and inside of us. And as you probably know, I mean, there are discussions in the European Union, how could we measure that in a more meaningful way? A key word could be bioassays, which measure the impact of a cocktail of chemicals instead that you stay in the classical way of simply measuring the toxicity of a single component. And our first speaker obviously reminded us what also Mark already said yesterday in the Central Asian panel, we thought one day we are cleverer than nature, so we have used a lot of chemistry and uh, as I always say, people first do something and then they understand what they do. So we understand that we are not cleverer than nature and we should probably try to go back to how nature has held everything into balance, but it's a long way. It's a lot of awareness raising, as we heard both from you, is needed in Spain, but also we heard in Kyrgyzstan, it's very important that people more understand all these interconnections. So there's a lot of work for us to do. And uh, I think that's great, because I think we can do something meaningful in our lives. And uh, so I would like to conclude this uh, session with many thanks first of you for your interest and the interest means you want to do something about it so good luck in whatever is ahead in your lives i don't know whether we will meet again because at the moment as far i know this is the last forum but uh, maybe life brings us all together at some moment and until then all the best good energy uh, creativity and good advances in solutions and many thanks and a uh, good launch now.